Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining me today, Sunday, March 20th, where we're going to continue on with the motion reading and review from Attorney Bonjean's filing of motion for Robert Sylvester Kelly on February 17th, 2022, under Sierra Code 19CR286. So let's get right into it. Lastly, the government's affecting interstate commerce evidence was insufficient where it could not establish what device, if any, was used to make these recordings. 6. Racketeering Act 8 The government failed to prove that defendant committed Man Act violations in connection with his sexual activity with Jane on or about April 28, 2015, and May 1, 2015, in the state of California. Jane was 17 years old in May 2015. She concedes that she misrepresented her age to defendant when she met him and kept her true age a secret until fall 2015. After meeting defendant in Orlando, Florida in April 2015, Jane traveled to meet him in California at the end of April 2015. The government charged defendant with two Man Act violations in connection with this trip, alleging first that defendant violated 18 U.S.C. Section 2421. A. Racketeering 8A, Transportation. Preliminarily, the government's use of the Mann Act under the present set of facts is unprecedented and unjustified. 18 U.S.C. Section 2421 provides that, Hoover knowingly transports any individual in interstate or foreign commerce, or in any territory or possession of the United States, with intent that such individual engage in prostitution or any sexual activity for which any person can be charged with a criminal offense, or attempts to do so, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years, or both. The government contended that defendant arranged for Jane to travel to California with the intent of willfully exposing her to a contagious, infectious, or communicable disease, in violation of Cal Health and Safety Code Section 120,290. The government failed to prove a Man Act violation under Section 2421 where it offered insufficient evidence that defendant transported Jane with the intent of exposing her to herpes and committed a violation of Cal Health and Safety Code Section 120,290 by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I. Intent. Because there is no link connecting defendant's transportation of Jane with an intent to expose her to herpes, defendant cannot be guilty of a Man Act violation. The Ninth and Tenth Circuit Courts of Appeal have held that to establish the intent requirement of the Mann Act violation, the government must prove that the illegal sexual activity is the dominant, significant, or motivating purpose behind the transportation. See United States v. Kinslow, 860 F2D 963. United States v. Lukashov, 694 F3D 1107, 1110. United States v. Cryer, 232 F3D 1318. Similarly, in United States v. Hayward, 359 F3D 631, the Third Circuit approved the district court's jury instruction that stated, It is not necessary for the government to prove that the illegal sexual activity was the sole purpose for the transportation. A person may have several different purposes or motives for such travel, and each may prompt in varying degrees the act of making the journey. The government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt, however, that a significant or motivating purpose of the travel across state or foreign boundaries was to have the individual transported to engage in the illegal sexual activity. In other words, the illegal sexual activity must have not been merely incident to the trip. ID. At 637. In United States v. Campbell, 49 F3D 1079, the Fifth Circuit analyzed the intent requirement of 18 U.S.C. Section 2421 and held that, in determining whether a dominant purpose exists, we instead ask whether the illicit behavior is one of the efficient and compelling purposes of the travel. ID. At 1083. See also, United States v. Vang, 128 F3D 1065, United States v. Perkins, 948 F3D 936, the illicit behavior must be one of the purposes motivating the interstate transportation. The Second Circuit does not seem to have answered the intent question, but whether this court applies a true, dominant purpose, standard or merely a, significant, or, motivating, purpose standard, the result is the same. 
The defendant's alleged violation of a California health law prohibiting him from exposing a partner to herpes was incidental to the trip. There is no proof in this record that demonstrates that defendant's motivating purpose in transporting Jane to California was to expose her to herpes. In fact, the government cannot even show that the motivating purpose of the trip had anything to do with Jane, as Jane herself testified when asked. Q. And while you were 17, did you take additional trips to California with the defendant? A. Yes, I did. Q. And do you remember where you traveled to? A. I do not. Q. Do you remember what the purpose of your travel was for? A. He had shows. In short, no rational juror could find that the government proved that defendant's intent to transport Jane to California was to infect with her herpes. Now, this is for the gentlemen listening to this podcast right now. Be very careful of internet, interstate commerce and the way that you invite women to your location, okay? Because this could be a way that a new precedent is going to be taken effect by the way that, you know, if someone cries rape on the internet, this could possibly be a precedent that they would try to use in order to inflict criminal act upon the idea of putting the connection together if sex does take place and if someone files a motion regarding um, rape or a, a domestic violence or abuse of any kind. So I want to, to point that out. In short, no rational juror could find that the government proved that defendant's intent to transport Jane to California was to infect with her herpes. E. Violation of Cal Health Safety Code Section 120,292. The government did not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that defendant committed a violation of the Cal. Health and Safety Code Section 120,290, because the government charged defendant with a repealed version of the statute no longer in effect, a version that reduced the government's burden of proof. Somebody, Prior to the jury charge in this case, somebody did not do their homework. This precedent was outdated. It was outdated. So it's not going to even be able to stand in court and and prosecution should not have been able to even bring it into the trial, the federal trial. Wow. Prior to the jury charge in this case, defendant notified the court that the jury instructions did not reflect the elements of Cal Health and Safety Code Section 120,290. The government acknowledged as much but argued that it charged defendant under the statute that was in effect in 2015. The government had no authority to charge defendant with a statute that was repealed or inoperative at the time of prosecution. United States v. Chambers, 291 U.S. 217, 223. In 2015, Section 120,290 of the California Health and Safety Code provided, except in provided in Section 120,291 or in the case of the removal of an afflicted person in a manner the least dangerous to the public health, any person afflicted with any contagious, infectious, or communicable disease who willfully exposes himself or herself to another person, and any person who willfully exposes another person afflicted with the disease to someone else, is guilty of a misdemeanor. The statute was overhauled entirely in 2018 after the California legislature determined that it was antiquated, having been passed during an era of discrimination toward those afflicted with HIV. The current statute bears little to no resemblance to the repealed 2015 version, least of all because it now requires a showing of a specific intent to transmit the disease. Although repealed or inoperative, the government proposed a jury instruction that attempted to reflect the elements of the 2015 statute. Apparently recognizing that the 2015 statute was unconstitutionally vague in any event, the government stepped into the shoes of the legislature and rewrote the statute to save it from a constitutional challenge. Thus, the government not only charged defendant with a repealed statute but rewrote it in clear violation of various constitutional provisions, including the separations of power clause and principles of comedy. Defendant's jury was instructed pursuant to a statute that never existed.
A California court has no authority to rewrite a California statute and neither does a district court sitting in New York. Even if the government had the authority to charge defendant under the 2015 version of Section 120,290 of the California Health and Safety Code, the statute does not pass constitutional muster. Most obviously, the statute is void for vagueness both on its face and as applied to the the bill analysis for the 2018 enactment sets forth the legislative history and rationale for repealing the version under which defendant was prosecuted. Defendant, the doctrine of vagueness, guards against arbitrary or discriminatory law enforcement by insisting that a statute provide standards to govern the actions of police officers, prosecutors, juries, and judges. Defendant, the doctrine of vagueness, guards against arbitrary or discriminatory law enforcement by insisting that a statute provide standards to govern the actions of police officers, prosecutors, juries, and judges. Sessions v. DeMaia, 138S Court 1204, 1212. As written, the 2015 law fails to provide adequate definitions that put individuals with any chronic and potentially contagious diseases on notice of what amounts to criminal conduct, including communicable diseases that are not sexually transmitted. By way of example, nearly 50% of the population has herpes simplex I, a communicable disease. Under the 2015 statute, anyone with herpes simplex I who kisses another person without disclosing that they have herpes simplex I is guilty of a misdemeanor. Even if the afflicted person has no active infection, outbreak, and does not pass the disease along to the recipient of the kiss. Under this statute, parents with herpes simplex I would be prohibited from kissing their own children. One cannot imagine how many arbitrary prosecutions could take place in this current era of a pandemic if this law was in effect today. Even if the elements of the statute were as the government alleged, insufficient evidence existed to sustain the charge. The government did not prove that defendant was contagious, infected, or had the capacity to transmit herpes during the sexual encounter he had with Jane in May 2015. Additionally, the government cannot show that defendant acted willfully with knowledge of the consequences. Presumably, the government assumes that the consequences is transmitting the disease to the person exposed. But effective treatments exist for herpes that significantly reduce outbreaks and the likelihood of transmission. If defendant was consistently taking Valtrex in April 2015, it cannot be said that he willfully exposed Jane, with knowledge of the consequences, particularly since Jane was not infected with herpes in April 2015. This racketeering act cannot be sustained where it was based on a repealed law, was rewritten and was facially unconstitutional in any event. b. Racketeering Act 8b, coercion or enticement The government alternatively argues that defendant is guilty of the Mann Act stemming from his April trip to California, because defendant knowingly, persuaded, induced, enticed, or coerced, Jane to travel to California. Insufficient evidence exists to prove that defendant took any action to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce Jane into traveling to California in April, May 2015. Quite the opposite, the record shows that Jane's mother purposefully and strategically enticed defendant with her 17-year-old daughter, comparing her to Aaliyah at various points. Mm. The government takes great umbrage to this characterization, but the record speaks for itself. Although defense counsel did not make much use out of it, government's Exhibit 233 offers powerful evidence showing that defendant had no reason to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce Jane into going to California with him. Text messages introduced by the government show that Jane, with the guidance of her mother, enticed defendant, who reasonably believed Jane was 18 years old, to bring her to California. In short, when Jane traveled to meet defendant in California in April-May, she required no enticement, persuasion, or encouragement of any kind. On April 11, 2015, Jane attended one of defendant's concerts in Orlando, Florida. After the show, someone provided Jane with defendant's phone number. Jane attempted to text the number on the phone and gave the paper to her mother. ID. Although Jane did not reach defendant, Jane's mother began texting the defendant posing as her 17-year-old daughter. Jane eventually communicated directly with the defendant via FaceTime and told the defendant she was 18 years of age. On April 20, 2015, Jane's mother, still posing as Jane, initiated text messages with defendant and arranged for Jane to meet the defendant at a hotel in Orlando. 
Government's Exhibit 233 shows that Jane and her mother knew from the start that defendant was interested in Jane sexually, believing that she was of legally consenting age. Before Jane's first meeting with defendant, Jane's mother texted Jane, stating, This man trying to screw but I'm trying to make it business, he knows you're a singer but he ain't playing he want to ft. Despite that Jane and her mother were on notice that defendant was interested in Jane sexually, Jane's mother encouraged Jane to meet defendant. She told Jane to keep defendant's curiosity piqued and advised her about what she should wear to effectively entice him. ID. During her in-court testimony, Jane testified that she went to meet defendant solely to audition for him, but her contemporaneous text messages reveal that Jane was more interested in defendant for personal and romantic reasons. Jane texted her mother, Ah, he's so fine. ID. When Jane's mother told her to be ready to sing something, Jane said, IGH, suggesting that she did not actually want to audition for defendant. Jane's mother encouraged Jane to tease defendant but not to do anything sexual with him since he would then lose interest in her. Believing that he was speaking to an 18-year-old Jane, defendant texted Jane's mother that he was staying on the tour bus but was going to get a hotel room for their privacy. Jane's mother then shared that message. With Jane, texting, Yep he said he's staying on the tour bus but he wants to get a hotel room for just y'all so y'all can get away from security and MGRS etc. Jane's mother gave Jane some final advice before she sent daughter to meet defendant, who believed Jane to be 18 years old. Be prepared to sing three songs he said he will meet you and listen to your song. Please have your glasses off hair to side. Mama knows best pretty hurts and third your choice don't yell. Dot put on a show. Dance grab his hand shimmy wiggle sit on his lap entice him. While singing it's all about performance. This your chance and opportunity don't blow it. Jane's mother even told Jane not to look, groan. Take off that ugly ass lipstick I told you he don't want you to be grown I told you to keep hair curly that shit look a mess you need some jeans or shorts you trying to look grown he wanted you cause you look young and innocent that's what he want not a little girl trying to be grown you're a damn fool. Defying her mother's advice to merely tease defendant, Jane engaged in sexual conduct with defendant in the hotel room. Jane stripped down to her undergarments and walked back and forth for defendant. She later acquiesced to removing her clothes, testifying that she got on top of him backwards and he did lick my butt. After the sexual encounter, officers arrived at the hotel room and knocked on the door. After arranging for Jane to meet defendant in his hotel, Jane's parents apparently called the police. Jane described defendant as nervous and anxious asking her to confirm that she was 18 years old as she had represented. Jane testified at trial, F tear he looked through the peephole, he made me go into the restroom immediately and told me to get dressed. And he said, are you 18? And I said, yes. And he said, don't lie to me. And I said, yes. ID. Defendant opened the door. Although defense counsel sought to present evidence that Jane's parents intended to set defendant up and extort him, the court precluded the testimony. And the police checked Jane's identification to confirm her age before leaving. Defendant was present when police officers checked Jane's identification. Rather than calling at night, Jane again removed her clothes and got on top of defendant to continue their sexual activities. After her first encounter with defendant, Jane told her mother that defendant had asked whether he could fly her to meet him. Jane told her mother, I said do a. Jane continued to communicate with the defendant via text message and by phone and continued to spend time with defendant in Orlando doing normal dating activities such as seeing movies and eating out. At one point, Jane's mother got frustrated with Jane for not prioritizing her music with defendant. On April 23, 2015, Jane's mother texted her, You need to let him hear your songs. Let him see your video. You trying to date the man you need to let him see your shit. Dot dot quote. Jane's mother also continued to encourage Jane's relationship with defendant, telling her to be a little, feisty, stating, he married Aliyah cause she was feisty she didn't let him run over her. You need to be different than the rest. Later that evening, Jane's mother texted Jane, you are silly that man ain't trying to do nothing with you musically he want to fuck period cause he like young girls. Jane reassured her mother that defendant was willing to look at her performances and was patiently waiting to look at some of her videos that her mother had emailed her. On April 24, 2015, after defendant had left Orlando, Jane's mother instructed Jane, you better be texting him so you will stay on his mind. Later that day, Jane texted her mother about flying out to see defendant in California. 
Jane, and I talked to R. Kelly. Mom, yeah about what Jane, LMAO about flying me out mom, oh really, when? Jane, yeah, whenever I tell him he can. Tomorrow if I choose mom, oh yeah. On April 28, 2015, Jane traveled to Los Angeles, California to meet defendant with the knowledge and consent of her parents. Jane continued to text with her mother once in Los Angeles. At one point her mother told her, he going to be in your room butt naked with one of his songs playing lol. Government's Exhibit 233 reflects that Jane and her mother texted incessantly while Jane was in Los Angeles with defendant. Jane tells her mother at one point, crazy this Aaliyah movie just came on and I just got off the phone with R. Mom responded, really crazy. Jane testified that she had oral sex with defendant in Los Angeles, but she did not share that information with her mother via text. At no point did Jane express any apprehensions about being with defendant or ask her mother to arrange for her to come home. When Jane excitedly told her mother that she was riding defendant's tour bus to Stockton to attend his concert, Jane's mother responded, OMG exciting you riding on the tour bus. On May 1, 2015, Jane's mother urged Jane to take advantage of defendant, texting her, it won't be star lifestyle if you don't get serious about your music and show this man you want to be famous like him. Once he tired of you you'll be like everybody else. You better use this as your opportunity while you got him in spell. Jane's mother then said, you should text him and be like you know you gonna be my boo and see what he say. To which Jane responded, El Mao. Jane traveled independently to meet defendant in Stockton, California where he was performing on May 1, 2015. She stayed in contact with her mother the entire time. At one point, Jane explained to her mother how she ended up going to Stockton to see defendant's performance, I told you. He asked me did I wanna come to his show I said of course and he said okay then. Let's pack this stuff up. He was even putting his stuff in my bag. Jane and her mother remained in constant communication before defendant's show. Jane's mother instructed her about what to wear and made suggestions about how she should behave at defendant's show, I would blow him lil kisses and wink at him and bite the tip of my finger mess with him real good. Do something seductive then make a silly face. Dot lol. Jane and her mother continued to text throughout defendant's performance. At one point, Jane and her mother exchanged the following texts. Jane, he's singing this whole show to me mom. Lol to funny Jane, frar Jane, Elmao Jane, this man in love. Mom, OMG you gonna marry him and have his baby's mom. Lol my son-in-law gonna be older than me mom. To dang funny Jane, Elmao. Mom, well you better get signed first then married second. While this court concluded that Jane's parents' testimony was not relevant for the purpose defense counsel sought to introduce it, Jane's text messages with her mother introduced as governments. Caught feelings is an expression that means when you meet a girl guy that you like and it starts to have an effect on you in an emotional way. Exhibit 233 were highly relevant evidence that defendant took no action to induce, persuade, or coerce Jane to travel with him. Jane was eager to travel with defendant and caught feelings for him as she admitted and concealed her age from defendant so she could pursue a relationship with him. The government's evidence fails to show that Jane was persuaded, induced, enticed, or coerced into traveling to California. 7. Racketeering Act 9. The government charged defendant with four-man act violations stemming from a trip with Jane to California between September 2015 and October 2015, two months before her 18th birthday. According to Jane, she disclosed her true age prior to this trip. The government's evidence is insufficient as to these man act violations. A. Racketeering Acts 9A, Transportation. For the same reasons argued in connection with Racketeering Act 8A, the government failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that defendant transported Jane with the intent of exposing her to herpes in September-October 2015, and committed a violation of Cal. Health and Safety Code Section 120,290 by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The arguments set forth, supra, are equally applicable Racketeering Act 9A. B. Racketeering Acts 9b, Coercion or Enticement Insufficient evidence exists to prove that defendant committed Racketeering Act 9b. By all accounts, defendant and Jane were in a serious relationship based in Illinois where defendant resided in fall 2015. 
Although Jane testified that she told defendant her true age after the summer ended in 2015, the record does not reflect precisely when she told defendant her true age. As such, the government failed to show that defendant possessed the requisite mens rea to sustain a charge of unlawful sexual intercourse with a person under 18 years old under the California Penal Code in September or October 2015. Furthermore, the record is devoid of evidence that defendant took any action to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce Jane into traveling to California between September and October 2015. Critically, when defendant learned that Jane had lied about her age, he sent her home to Florida. Jane returned to Chicago with her parents' consent. Although it is true that Jane's parents did not have the authority to consent to any illegal sexual activity between Jane and the defendant, their permission to allow her to stay with defendant is reflective of Jane's desire to continue her relationship with defendant. Jane offered no testimony to suggest that she was coerced or enticed into traveling to California in fall 2015. Jane's testimony about defendants, rules, and sexual proclivities during this time period are not sufficient evidence of coercion to travel even if Jane now believes with the benefit of hindsight that defendants' conduct was controlling or constituted some type of grooming. Okay, <clears throat> now we're getting to the point where people are so upset about him with dating young girls, but how do you prove with a driver's license with the state identification that you're not the age that that license says you are. So they should be held in contempt of court to give falsified information. You can't go into court with dirty hands and expect to be given, you know, some form of compensation. It's like, this is so weird. We're going to keep going. Um, we're on page 45, but um, we're going to keep going here. C. Racketeering Act 9C, Coercion or Enticement. The government charged defendant with a Man Act violation under the separate theory that defendant transported Jane to California in September or October 2015 with the intent to violate California Penal Law Sections 261.5 and 261. 5. Unlawful sexual intercourse with a person under 18. Preliminarily, for the reasons argued, supra, the government simply failed to prove that defendant took any action to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce Jane into traveling to California. By late 2015, defendant and Jane were in serious relationship based primarily in Illinois where defendant resided. The age of consent in Illinois is 17, therefore, the defendant and Jane's sexual relationship was not prohibited there. Jane traveled with defendant to numerous states as one of his partners. She went consensually and voluntarily. Defendant did not have to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce her to travel, even if the government is correct that defendant had exerted some dominance or control in the relationship at the time. Furthermore, as argued in connection with Racketeering Act 5, the government provided insufficient evidence that defendant used any words to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce Jane to travel to California via a facility of interstate commerce. Under the plain reading of the statute, there must be a nexus between the use of the facility of interstate commerce and the words of persuasion, enticement, or coercion to satisfy a Section 2422 violation. The record is devoid of that proof. The mere fact that defendant texted with Jane about any number of things does not satisfy the interstate commerce element of this Man Act violation. D. Racketeering Act 9D, Transportation. Okay, so we're going to stop right there and I'm going to break this portion. We're on page 46. So I'm going to break this portion into another segment. So what are, you, what, what are your views? I mean, <laughs> you hear specifically what was presented in federal trial on the stand testimony by the individual who claims that she lied about her age and she had a false identification and her mother coerced her into propagandizing her body to R. Kelly. What are your views? Um, I thank you so much for liking, joining, and subscribing to this podcast. And uh, we will see you next Sunday.